Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak. And I am going to try and explain Thanks. everything. It is a little bit uh, uh, deep, as, as Margaret has said, in science. But I think it's important that we uh, discuss this particular paper. Um, this came out of Europe, and it's uh, described as a European best practice of lipedema. In this particular paper, there are consensus statements, but there are also uh, opinions of the authors, uh, which makes this paper a little bit confusing and important to discuss. And before I do that, I want to give you what our current thinking about lipedema is. So we no longer think of lipedema tissue as just fat. Uh, we know now that fat is loose connective tissue. That's what you're going to find. So connective tissues include loose connective tissue, dense connective tissue, and specialized connective tissues. So specialized connective tissues include cartilage, bone, blood, and lymph. Dense tissues, you're going to find these tissues, for example, in tendons or ligaments. And then there's loose connective tissues. And there's different types of those. And the one that we are interested in today is adipose tissue. So we have um, different connective tissues in our body. And you probably have heard of the term fascia. And fascia are just the connective tissues working together as a whole. So our whole body is made up of different connective tissues. So there are dense connective tissues. And those are shown here. And you can see how the fibers line up against each other very tightly. And then there's loose connective tissue and fat is included in that. And that's a bunch of cells um, that move freely around each other. There are different things in connective tissue, including cells, fibers such as collagen and elastin, and also something called ground substance. And this ground substance forms a gel between things called glycosaminoglycans, which are simply just sugar molecules that repeat together, water and ions such as sodium. And this gel can become thicker and it can be loose, become looser depending on the amount of water that's present in there. And when we take these fibers and this ground substance together, we call this the extracellular matrix or the area that's present in our connective tissue outside of cells. And it looks something like this. And this isn't a very good picture, but if you um, look on the internet for strolling under the skin, you can actually see videos of what this looks like. And you can see that our skin is up here. This is, for example, a tendon. And here are the fibers, such as collagen and elastin. And in between those fibers is this gel substance where water and sodium reside. So let's look at lipedema differently now. We're going to look at it, at it as a connective tissue disorder. So we know that lipedema, therefore, is a loose connective tissue disease or a connective tissue disease. And the pathology or the problems with the connective tissue in lipedema are that there's a lot of fibrosis or scarring and there is edema. We know that primarily arms and legs are affected in women, so the trunk is spared. And I say in women, even though we know that lipedema can occur in men, most of the descriptions of lipedema have been made for women. So there may need to be new descriptions for men. The hands, feet, and trunk are disproportionately unaffected in lipedema. So we know this makes lipedema different from lymphedema but we know that with lipedema, there is a risk for lymphedema. Margareta? Yeah. Uh, the question then is, there is, a, there is a recent papers uh, in Europe, I would say, questioning whether lipedema is a disease with edema. And there is no scientific evidence that lipedema is an edema problem. Can you please answer that question? question, Karen. Yes. So, is it true? Is it true? 
Is it true? Is it true yes. that there is no edema in lipedema? Mm. And my yes. answer to that is no. And I want to explain that using the connective tissue. So what's the definition of edema? Edema is swelling of soft tissues due to increased interstitial fluid. And by interstitial fluid, we mean the fluid between the cells in that extracellular matrix. So here's a picture of lipedema tissue from the thigh. You can see I've labeled all the fat cells here. And in between those cells, you, you see the fibers that I talked about in that this extracellular matrix. There's also some blood vessels here, 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 and here. But you can see there's also some white space here. And in that white space, we think is the fluid and also sodium and glycosaminoglycans. So here's that gel. So I'm gonna blow up this area right here and make it into a cartoon. I've done that here, it looks a little complicated, but here's one fat cell, here's another fat cell, and these are the collagen molecules here. This is our matrix. And here's some elastin fibers here as well. And in here are these glycosaminoglycans, these are just repeating sugars, sugar molecules that repeat, and they are negatively charged and they bind up sodium and they bind up water. And these glycosaminoglycans can bind to a protein here and make this big structure, which we call a proteoglycan or a glycoprotein. And you can see those here. And the most abundant glycosaminoglycan outside the cells, so between the fat cells, is hyaluronin. It's also known as hyaluronic acid, and we put it on our skin to keep us beautiful. And this hyaluronin can actually bind up these large proteoglycans and make a huge complex. So in between our cells, our bodies have the ability to store a lot of water. And this water is bound up here to all different uh, kinds of glycosaminoglycans. Water can also exist free. And when it's free flowing in the tissue, there's a lot of proteins that flow within it like albumin. And you can also find electrolytes here too, like sodium. Any fluid that leaves our blood vessels, and here is shown the capillary, which is the smallest blood vessel in our body. Any fluid that leaves that and, and enters this area between cells has to leave back out through lymphatic vessels. So if you damage this lymphatic vessel, fluid is gonna build up here as free, and it's gonna build up here bound to those glycosaminoglycans. In lipedema, we know that our lymphatics function well, at least initially. Even if there may be problems in their structures, they still function and fluid can actually leave. So the water that builds up in lipedema builds up here. So if we look at an ultrasound picture of lymphedema tissue and lipedema tissue, you can see these black spaces here in the, the fat tissue below the skin. So here's the skin in lymphedema, here's the skin in lipedema. These black spaces show free fluid. You don't see that in lipedema. And you don't see the bound up water. You cannot see the bound up water on ultrasound. So this is a kind of an easy cartoon to understand the difference between the two. In lipedema, these glycosaminoglycans bind up fluid. In lymphedema, glycosaminoglycans do bind up fluid, but there's also excess free fluid. And women with lipedema and men can progress to lymphedema because it's in the spectrum. If the lymphatics are damaged, the free fluid will build up. So we do believe that there is edema in lipedema. I think everybody just needs to have a better understanding of where our, our bodies store water and how. We have some data to support this theory, and that is that uh, we have found that extracellular water, so water outside the cells is higher in the loose connective tissue of women with lipedema. And we also know that the sodium content is higher in the skin and loose connective tissue of women with lipedema. So there, there's your proof right there, higher amounts of water, higher amounts of sodium, 
but women with lipedema, at least early on, don't have lymphedema. Where is the water being stored? It's bound up to glycosaminoglycans. In kind of some proof for lymphedema, in this mouse model of lymphedema, they take the little mouse and they cut around its tail and it causes it to swell, forming lymphedema. And they found that hyaluronin, which is the most abundant glycosaminoglycan in, in tissue, it increased immediately in this model and then it stayed elevated chronically in this model. So that supports that fluid is not only free in lymphedema, it is also bound. And that's bound to that hyaluronin. Margareta? Mm -hmm. Is it true that there is no scientific evidence that lipedema is the cause of lymphedema? So the, um, this paper, suggests that the only reason women with lipedema could develop lymphedema is because they gain a lot of weight and become obese. So the answer is no. And I think everyone knows about the new paper that came out from Stanley Roxon and Guillermo Oliver. And they identified a molecule called platelet factor four or CXCL4. And this is a biomarker that can be used to diagnose lymphatic vas vascular dysfunction. And they looked at women with stage one, stage two, and stage three lipedema, and they found that PF4 levels were elevated in lipedema patients. And this supports current claims arguing that at least some of the underlying attributes of this disease are also the consequence of lymphatic defects. So I think this confirms that lymphatic abnormalities are important in lipedema. And they found these PF4 molecules in uh, exosomes. And so I want to explain what exosomes are. Cells. And they contain proteins, RNA, DNA, so all sorts of parts of the cell. So if this is a lymphatic cell, it's going to have specific proteins, RNA, and DNA that we can monitor if it excretes these out into the environment. And by transmission electron microscopy, you can see what they look like. There's these little circles that contain packages of the cells. And if there's inflammation, there are increased exosomes or increased packages of the cells. And we can pick those out and look inside them and say, what cell did that come from? And in this case, that's what Dr. Roxon and Dr. Oliver did. So PF4 or CXCL4 is a protein that's primarily released from platelets. It's known to inhibit the growth of new blood vessels and it helps to promote our immune system to respond to things. So it, it promotes inflammation and it can be bound to to glycosaminoglycans, it can be bound to platelets, it can be bound to immune cells. So it's, it's pretty ubiquitous in the body. And this is an example of, of how you could get increased uh, PF4 or CXCL4. So let's say there's some inflammation in the liver. This, the liver releases molecules that activate platelets that release CXCL4. This molecule then activates our immune cells and makes them more active, and they make more immune cells and also increase inflammation. This increased inflammation also stimulates fibrogenesis or fibrotic tissue, meaning there's more of, those, of that matrix that's laid down, and that can cause fibrosis in the liver. And we think something similar may be happening in the lipedema tissue of women. And the interesting part of this paper is that this, these exosomal PF4 molecules were not associated with increased body weight. And so the argument from the Myths and Facts paper five is that women with lipedema become obese and develop lymphedema, but these PF4 levels were not associated with obesity. Therefore, they are independent of obesity and therefore primarily associated with problems in the lymphatic system. Another um, concept in the, the paper um, that um, 
I think there's some confusion about is that they cited 150 cases where there is a high level of psychological vulnerability in the majority of patients with lipedema. And I think the, this, these words, psychological vulnerability, are not clear, and we don't really know what that means. And there is no the data, it's not been published, so it's really hard to say what they are meaning. But one of the statements that they made is that mental health issues were present before the onset of the typical lipedema symptoms and have therefore an influence in the patient's perception of pain. And this is suggesting that women, before they develop lipedema, have mental health issues that cause them to have more pain. So, Margareta? Yeah, do pre-existing mental health issues appear before symptoms in lipedema? So it's a great question and it's, there's no easy answer to this. As you can imagine, investigating mental health issues in women before they develop lipedema, when do women develop lipedema? A lot of them develop it at the time of puberty. And this paper also states there's no evidence that women develop lipedema at the time of puberty. That means we would have to question young girls and their mental health issues. And that's a very difficult population because they're going through puberty and so many things are going on in our brains during puberty. So I looked into this. Yeah, where is the data? I looked into this and I found that there are some studies that have looked at when do you when is the onset of psychopathology in the brain and when is the onset of pain and there are a couple of uh, mental health issues that precede pain and these in include substance abuse so someone who has a genetic predisposition to abuse for example alcohol or drugs which i have just not seen a lot of in the lipedema population and also anxiety disorder there are a major depressive disorder can occur before or after the onset of pain, but there's a lot more psychopathology that occurs ac after pain and is activated by pain. And these include a genetic predisposition to anxiety or panic, anxiety sensitivity, somatize somatization, maladaptive personality traits, and poor coping mechanisms. So these are all the things that can be caused by pain. So I think the answer is, we don't know. It's very complicated. We need to see the data. And I, I think that we need to take this as, not as a finger pointing at women with lipedema saying, you're crazy and therefore you're developing lipedema and pain. I think it's trying to get at some of the complex psychological issues that are associated with lipedema and we live in a fat shaming society. And so I think that makes the whole problem much more complex. I agree with you, Karen. Uh, and then question four, don't women with lipedema have hypermobile joints and aren't hypermobile joints associated with anxiety? anxiety? So this is very interesting. It's something that I didn't know about when I first learned about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is one form of hypermobile joints. But there is a very strong association between hypermobility and anxiety. And we know that, that about 50% of women with lipedema in the US have hypermobile joints. And I know that it's about the same in Germany. I don't know what it is in Sweden. And we do know that hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is strongly associated with anxiety disorders. And they think that there are genetic risks that cause people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome to develop anxiety. And these can include, uh, include changes in genes that are being investigated, autonomic system dysfunction, and this means that your autonomic nervous system controls your body without you having to think about it. So it controls your heart rate and your blood pressure. 
if your autonomic nervous system is not working well, your heart rate can beat very fast and you can have feelings of anxiety. There may be other things uh, like a lot of stimuli from inside the body or outside the body uh, that can induce anxiety and also the inability to know where your joints are in time and space or proprioception can affect it too. And there's imaging studies that have shown that uh, there's an area of the brain that's important in our emotional processing of things and that's very active in people who have Ehlers-Danlos. So we need a lot more work in this area. Question five, is it true that treatment of lipedema with manual yes. lymphatic drainage therapy is obsolete? So the answer is no, because we know that there is edema in lipedema and we know that therapists use deep tissue treatment during manual lymphatic drainage to improve lipedema tissue. And they do this to improve the tissue structure and to drain excess fluid. So we know that the manual lymphatic drainage for lipedema actually allows fat cells to release their fat where before they could not. It improves circulation, it improves the small capillaries and makes them healthier and it reduces lipedema pain. And we also know that deep manipulation for lipedema tissue has been described. It breaks down the fibrosis, it reduces tissue volume, and it reduces fat by the gold standard DEXA scan. And I think it's really important to continue to maintain your therapy, especially during COVID-19, that there's a lot of things that you can do to improve your lipedema tissue. These include massaging the tissue with your hands or having um, a, a family member that you're quarantining with um, help you massage the lipedema tissue. You can vibrate the, the lipedema tissue, and this was actually recommended by Dr. Vodder. Exercise of any kind is helpful, including swimming, but you can do, you can jump up and down, you can shake your arms and legs, you can walk around. Anything that you can do to keep moving helps move the fluid through the tissue. Compression garments help reduce pain and contain that fluid. Um, eating healthy so that you don't gain additional weight during uh, this pandemic. And you can actually treat your uh, lipedema tissue with ice or ice and heat and ice and heat, and that helps move the fluid and reduce inflammation. I think you have some pumps, some external pumps that you can apply to the tissue. That helps move fluid through the tissue. And then keeping your brain active um, and it maintaining interactions, for example, through Zoom. There's also some supplements that you could take, and you can also just take these as food. So we know that vitamin C actually improves the structure of tissue, such as lipedema tissue. And in there, I use the word compliance. And lipedema tissue is very compliant, meaning it allows fluid to just accumulate and bind up to those glycosaminoglycans. And we wanna make that better. So I, the anti-inflammatory vitamin C can do that. And you can get vitamin C from all um, kinds of different citrus fruits. Diazomin is also an anti-inflammatory, and you can get that from citrus or you can get that from peppermint. And so drinking like lemon water is one way to get your diazomin. You don't have to take it as a capsule. And just so you know, not everybody uh, re is going to respond in the same way to um, supplements. And then there's another idea that I had. We want to decrease that fibrosis and break up that glycosaminoglycan gel. And I think digestive enzymes are useful in doing that. And you have, um, I think you're familiar with Wobenzyme. It's an enzyme product out of Germany. I do believe it's available in, in, uh, outside of Germany and Europe. And there's other enzymes called serapeptase or natokinase, uh, which we use here. But you can get enzymes from food. So bromelain, bromelain from pineapple, papayas have a lot of enzymes, mangoes, honey, bananas, avocados, sauerkraut, kiwi fruit, ginger. 
And I've starred the ones that um, aren't high in sugar because I know uh, a lot of ladies with lipedema are trying the keto diet or trying to eat low carb. And then any kind of, um, if, any kind of exercise you can do after eating enzyme rich foods like using your external pump or exercising or using manual therapy. So you, what you wanna do is loosen up those glycosaminoglycans and then move them out. Question six. Is lipedema always painful? So I think the answer to that is no. So if you look at the original, one of the original papers that came from uh, Dr. Allen and Hines from the Mayo Clinic, they said about 40% of women had pain in their tissue and about 50% of women had tenderness. So not all women with lipedema had pain. So I don't think pain is an absolute requirement for a lipedema diagnosis. For example, if you are a woman with lipedema who has painful tissue and you do therapies such as manual therapy, you use a pump, you do a lot of exercise, you watch what you eat and your pain goes way down so you can't really feel it anymore, does that mean you no longer have lipedema? And I, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, is painless lipedema called lipohypertrophy? Hyper hypertrophy. I can't Lipo even pronounce it. I know, <laughs> lipohypertrophy. And it, that just means increased fat. So the definition of lipohypertrophy is painless, disproportionate increase in adipose tissue. Uh, the, one of the original uh, descriptions is that there's increased symmetric subcutaneous fat deposits on the legs and arms of women. That sounds like lipedema. And Herpert said that it always precedes lipedema. So you start off by growing fat, it's not painful, and then over time it becomes painful and you develop edema and then you have lipedema. So that means that lipohypertrophy is the absence of pain and edema. Mm. And there are a few problems with that. Um, Herpert also said there are painful subtypes of lipohypertrophy. So what is the difference between painful lipohypertrophy and painful lipedema? And there's another paper out of the, out of the Netherlands that said if you elevate your legs, that will improve your symptoms. And I asked the authors, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, if you have venous hypertension, so you have venous insufficiency or, or increased pressure in the veins, that you're gonna get pain and swelling at the end of the day. And if you elevate your legs, it, you're gonna feel better. So I think that we really don't understand what exactly is lipohypertrophy and what exactly is lipedema and where do you draw the line? I do know that the fat in both of these conditions is difficult to lose by diet, exercise, or, or bariatric surgery. So it may be that in lipohypertrophy, you get increased fluid, which results in pain, and that is a definition of lipedema. It has been stated that liposuction is not a treatment option in patients with a BMI 35 kilo per square meter and simultaneous central obesity, WHTR. That's yeah, like a weight height. Yeah, weight weight height. Height. Okay, is this true? So I think the answer to that needs explanation. So what they're saying is if a woman with lipedema develops fat on her abdomen, she's no longer a candidate for liposuction. So in, in my opinion, women with lipedema uh, women with lipedema can develop lipedema tissue on their abdomen. And so not all fat on the abdomen is obesity. And I think lipedema patients should be considered individually for liposuction. I don't think we are at the point where we can say who can have a liposuction and who can't have liposuction depending on where they hold the fat on their body. We need more data. So just to conclude, I think that we are changing our view of what lipedema is. We are thinking of lipedema not just as a problem with fat, but that it is a connective tissue disease. And we knew that fluid 
is not just flowing free in tissue, that it's bound up and held within the tissue, bound to glycosaminoglycans in lipedema, but also in lymphedema. And that excess fluid in both areas, either area, suggests that manual therapies are important. So manual therapy is important for lipedema to help get move that fluid out from between those cells. And I think having lipedema that is disbelief, uh, or women with lipedema, women with lipedema tend to be disbelieved. They are told they are just fat, and therefore treatments are restricted from them. And I think this can easily result in anxiety and depression. And I, however, I think that a lot of women with lipedema have hypermobile joints, which is linked to anxiety. And we need to better understand uh, these mental uh, ramifications of lipedema and that we shouldn't be making statements about it until we have really good data on what comes before and what comes after lipedema. And I think that women with lipedema should be treated as individuals and that therapies should be designed for you as a woman with lipedema. And these therapies should include manual therapies, compression garments, liposuction, as well as other treatments. And I think that what works exactly well for one woman with lipedema, for example, a woman with stage one, may not work exactly well for a woman with stage three lipedema. And that's why I think we all need to be treated as individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much. We have a couple of questions. Yes, good. Um, now let's see, we have first one question. Trauma can cause hormone changes. Couldn't that also trigger lipedema when already in predestinated? What comes first, anxiety or trauma and lipedema on that? I think maybe you talked about that before, but please a short yeah. answer. Yeah, so um, trauma can definitely cause hormone changes, absolutely. And I think there's a, um, in people who have hypermobile joints, there is a heightened response to trauma. So there's a great risk for post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think any time post-traumatic stress disorder can affect many things and cause many pathologies in the body. Um, I also, you know, trauma, for example, surgery is a trauma. If a woman has a, um, a hysterectomy and her ovaries are removed and her hormones change dramatically at that time, um, that can also add to um, the development of anxiety, depression, PTSD, et cetera. Um, any, any time the body gains weight, you know, when we get, sometimes we gain weight and we're not exactly sure why we haven't changed our eating habits. Um, you know, there's changes going on in the body that we really don't understand. Anytime you gain weight for whatever reason, it can actually worsen your lipedema. Yeah. Yes. And I think this is, uh, somebody said to me that uh, a man, he has the same body the whole life, more or less. But we change our bodies three times, at least if we have babies also. At so, least. So we don't know, really know when you are in puberty or when you're pregnant or when you are in menopause, is this really what it should be like or not? And it takes a long time for us to understand that maybe this is not natural. Uh, maybe and we cycle. Yes. We yeah. cycle our hormones yes. every month, every month. And so you're going to feel differently at different parts of your cycle. Yes. And there's um, different um, inflammation can occur at different parts of the cycle. So right before you have your menses, you have a higher amount of inflammation in your body. And that can affect the development of lipedema as well. Yeah. We have some more questions, but I can't really reach them. Lisbeth, can you get the... Yeah. Uh, uh, GAG bound fluid, does it matter if we eat much sugar or not? So sugar actually increases the amount of fluid that leaves from your capillaries and fluid causes inflammation to rise in the body and that causes more fluid to leave from your capillaries. So we want to try and, and have normal amounts of fluid leaving from the capillaries. So I'd say try to avoid uh, high sugars, 
And I know fruit, some, you know, is considered to be high sugar sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you want to kind of pick your fruits depending on their, um, their sugar content and eat those, um, not all day long, but you know, one or two fruit servings a day. And then the rest of your food should um, be not processed. So try to avoid things in boxes. Um, try to avoid and just eat whole foods if you can. And um, salt, if you can just not add salt to your food, that would be good as well. We get um, plenty of salt in the foods that we eat. Um, with that said, there are some people who have like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS or have autonomic dysfunction and they need salt in order to maintain their blood pressure. And so you, if you are one of those people, you can ignore what I just said there. But for the rest of us, if you can avoid just eating, you know, taking a salt shaker and putting salt on your food. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? We are now, or in Sweden, we are examining uh, if there is some kind of evidence for lipedema treatment. And uh, it is um, not so good in the world. Uh, is it, do you have any suggestion that we could actually get hold of science, which is now on its way? Because we have until end of March, 2021, to dig it up and to produce it to all these people at the authorities and at uh, the Department of Social Affairs also. I know that there is a, a, a study coming out of Vanderbilt um, showing that um, suction assisted manual lymphatic drainage improves pain in lipedema. And I don't know what else that they're looking at. I guess we'll wait and see um, when that paper comes out. So that's one study. Um, I'm not sure I know of any other studies looking at manual therapies and lipedema. There may be um, some in Germany. Um, those are really um, expensive studies to do. And so they're going to need um, funding. And I did cite a couple studies um, showing that manual lymphatic drainage did help uh, with lipedema, but they're not, you know, really large studies, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And do you know um, if Lipedema Foundation has concentrated on specific funding for specific studies? Yeah, um, yeah. if you go to their website, you can see um, what they funded. They are interested yeah. in the extracellular matrix. Uh, they are interested in the lymphatic system and you know, they're, they're really interested in finding the science under what, you know, what causes lipedema. If we could get down to exactly what that is. So um, they're, they're making a big funding effort to support the study of the genetics of lipedema. So if we could find the gene or genes, that would be important. And they, um, they and I um, believe that there is more than one gene that influences the development of lipedema. And do you know about the research at St. George's Hospital with Peter Mortimer and Christiana Gordon? Have yeah. they, are they doing on the genes? Do they do research on the genes? They are doing research on the genes. And I, my understanding is that they are trying to bring these groups together to combine their data to try and figure out which gene is important. So if, if one group says, oh, I'm, I'm zeroing in on this group of genes, the other groups can look at those genes as well. And that should move things along a lot faster. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them on the chat and we can ask uh, Karen if you have any questions. And Meanwhile, I'll ask you, I've asked them to put them, but do you have any suggestion for us? How can we move forward? We are, when we were influencing in the, I'm, I'm in the, a member of the uh, government patient council. I talked with the minister a lot. I talked with the authorities a lot. And everybody say, as long as there is no evidence, 
we cannot suggest anything. And I say, well, you have to start with best practice and then you go on to innovation and then you can do research and then you will have good care. But if you don't do anything at all, uh, nothing will happen. And all these people need, need to, to understand their own disease and to try to learn to live with it and to get some care for it. Yeah. I, so, I think it would, I mean, you are absolutely right in terms of, you know, best practices. And there are many countries that now have best practices out. We are actually coming out with the best practices as well in the U.S., everyone knows that there is a problem with, you know, in lipedema and that it needs to be treated. Yeah. So I, I think that that's, that's done. That's a fact. The, the problem is, you know, we don't really understand lipedema completely. I, I feel like we understand it a little bit better now. Um, if, if we view it as a connective tissue disease, if you just view it as a problem with fat cells, then it, it sounds too much like obesity, and then it, it becomes just an obesity problem, which is not the case. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if we could get some funding, and it would be good if, if we could make, you know, in all the, the countries, if we could make a list of funding sources uh, for lipedema so that we could um, try some, you know, more therapies and do some more therapy studies. I do know that um, you know they've done a lot of liposuction studies in Europe, but there haven't been a lot of um, you know standard treatment mm. studies mm. on compression, on pumps, on manual therapies, and I think that absolutely needs to be done. And we did a, a deep tissue therapy study in the U.S. We only needed seven women, and we found significant improvements in volume, tissue structure and um, in, in the ability to lose fat. The problem is the body, nothing's, nothing's a cure. I mean, this is an ongoing chronic disease that we have to figure out how we can treat it on a daily basis. Yeah. And so it becomes a partnership between healthcare and, and a woman who has lipedema. Yes. And we need to learn from each other. A lot of women with lipedema are extremely bright they know a lot their bodies very well. They know things they do that can treat it. How can we translate that to people who do the research? And so that when we have a research study, we can ask the right questions. Yes. Yes, um, I agree with you. We have a question here. How can I treat my connective tissue? So connective tissue, as you saw, it, it's a web under our skin and it moves and it has to move um, in order for fat tissue and tendons and ligaments to move easily by each other. And so you want to uh, feel your tissue and see how stiff it is. The stiffer the tissue is, the more fibrotic it is. And then you want to learn some uh, treatments that you can do yourself at home. For example, there are rollers that you can use on your skin. There are gua sha tools. Uh, you can use your hands. You can use a foam roller. So all different ways to press and release the tissue so that it can improve the flow. And so you can look up things like myofascial release. That is a physical therapy that is available in every country. And that is a great treatment for lipedema. And all, I mean, all physical therapists and massage therapists know how to do myofascial release. Great place to start. You can look up on um, videos and, and watch how to use a foam roller. And of course you wanna use a foam roller safely and do it at your level. Um, and you, you wanna know what kind of foam roller, really stiff or, or a softer foam roller. So there are things you, you need to think about. But just those two things, myofascial release and a foam roller would get you down that path and help you to uh, uh, soften up your tissue. So if it's firm, you wanna soften it. That's a great way to start. That sounds gorgeous. We put that in the lymph in our journal, you know. <laughs> Perfect. And I have another one. 
Uh, are there any plans on starting a center somewhere in the world where we can go and try out what works the best for each and every one of us, like a Smurgos board? And you and I, we have talked about this for a long time now, many years, I think, together with the Swedish team, Darker. So we are really trying to do this. And I just wish we could accomplish that. Um, yeah. Sooner or later, yeah. we'll do it. Yeah. Uh, and it's very difficult and it, we need a lot of funding, yes. but we're working on it. And, and sooner or later it will be there because yes. there is no place in the world right now where you can do and try out what works the best. That's right. That's right. Uh, I think maybe the Feldy Clinic could have been one place, but I do not think it is the right place today. Not can right you, now. No. Uh, and I don't know about the Vodder school, if they have places where you actually can go and test. I, that is really difficult to go out and try what works the best because it's so individual. But I would think that Feldy Clinic would be. Um, Vodder has a place also, right? Uh, they have, I know they have a school, um, but I'm not sure they have a like a clinic where you could actually go try things out. But I think it's such a it's such a great idea. I really want to do it. Um, there, I I'm talking to people here in the U.S. about getting it done. We do need funding. It, it's it is going to happen. Probably not in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, maybe not even in 2021. But maybe we could aim for 2022. Yeah. What about Shingale? He had a clinic uh, in Germany. I don't know, because people could go there and not try out. He had a program. But then I heard him talk about what he was offering there. And, and it wasn't really, um, it was not in the type that you actually could test and try and for research. It was more come here and do it and pay the money for it. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. Something. Yeah, like I that. think we need to, like you said, we have, you know, everything should involve research. Otherwise, how are we going to know? You know, if, if you try something and you say, wow, that felt really good. Yeah. Well, what did it do? You know, you just yeah, because exactly. it felt good doesn't mean that, you know, we understand what that's doing and, and that's just not going to help us get support to continue that kind of treatment. So yeah. I think it's on us as healthcare providers to figure out how to connect the research. It may be that you have to pay for a service, you know, but I think that pay should be very small, yeah. very, very small so that you could try things out and we could collect that data. What we had um, visioned in Team Darkroom was a center of excellence. So you could actually go there for a diagnosis. You could be treated, you could be rehabilitated you would go there for checkups and you would have research connected to that. And that yeah, is yeah. still, I think, our dream um, and Team Derkham's dream. And um, we try to talk with, and you met the politicians in Stockholm also last year. So we really heavily tried that. And, and it may be, maybe they will loosen up, but yeah. they haven't done it yet. And I think we should We're treat struggling. Lindsay and lipedema. Sorry? I think we should treat both lipedema and lymphedema. Yes, and I would see a, a, a center of excellence for chronic edema. So it yeah. would be, yeah, all lipedema, Durkheim's disease, lymphedema, Durkheim, lymphedema. Primary, primary and secondary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that would be fantastic. And that is what we actually are striving for. And in all our talks with the politicians, that is what we try to, uh, try to uh, see. And of course, we, we need funding from them, but we need funding from research funding from other people, other parts also. Yes. But we, we have worked on that together and we don't give it up, right? Right. No. That's so right. That is, yes. So that is good. Um, and, and I have here also um, another it's statement. If you make it also a research facility, it's easier to get funding and permissions, permissions for treatment um, as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. so and I think, we I think uh, uh, you know, if you came to the center, 
and you didn't want to participate in research, you should still be able to try all the treatments and get yes. treated. You know, I, I think that it, it should be just a, a flowing, you know, structure of of research participation and and clinical treatment. Yeah. Um, and I have a last thing here. Will, will Karen show up in Sweden this year? Karen, will you show up in Sweden this year? <laughs> Maybe I would, of course, I love Sweden. I would love to come, but probably not this year, but I do want to come again. And I think um, this time we need to come with strong plans. Yes. Plans and, and um, we need to find funding sources so that we can work together as a group to get that funding. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, a large hug, Karen. Thank you thank for being you. there. And thank we'll you. see each other soon, I hope. Love launch time yeah. and for the rest of you thank you very much for joining this yeah. bye, bye everybody and bye bye, bye, -bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.